yeah, I'm nothing much compared to God, right? We have the image of perfection before us in Jesus. So when we look at ourselves, it's like, man, what am I? Um, sorry, I need another mic stand just for this one and for the guitar, if that's all right. Um, but how God looks at us is incredibly different to how we see ourselves, right? When you look at the word of God and what God says about us, it's very different to our narrative of ourselves. So this song is simply called It's True. Because when you read God's word and what he says about us, that's what's true. And that's what we need to believe. And that's what we need to trust. And that will change us. So give us a second while we get the mics organized. And then we'll play it for you. Yeah, last time I was here was 25 years ago. (laughs) And uh, I recognize some of the saints here that were back then. And it's so good to see you again. And it's great to be here. And it's great to see the glorious work that God's doing here. Amen. And and that work is you. You're the work. And he's doing a beautiful thing in your life. Praise the Lord. Amen. (laughs) One, two. You don't have to sing, do you? But inside I'm still a mess It's true I try to figure out Why you love me You say don't waste your breath Just believe what you say Cause you say that I am loved by you You say that my past is forgotten and dead You say that I live in It's true. You said that I am loved by you. You said that my past is forgotten and dead. You said that I live in heaven with you. And it's true. It's true. in my sin, we were putting nails in you, it's true, I try to figure out why you love me, you say don't waste your breath, just believe what you say, cause you say that I am loved by you, you say that my past is forgotten and dead, you say that I live in heaven with you, and it's true, it's true, you said that I am loved by you, you said that my past is forgotten and dead, you said that I live in heaven with you, and it's true, it's true. Yo 
is forgotten and dead you said that i live in heaven with you and it's true it's true you said that i am loved by you you said that my past is forgotten and dead you said that i live in heaven with you and it's true just wondering if I got distortion. Well, my brain does. <laughs> it's always distorted. I don't know about you. But isn't that good to be saved? Look at the world. What a mess. But look at the kingdom of God. Isn't it glorious? Isn't it good to be saved and in your left mind and right mind? Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, one of the things I've found throughout my walk with the Lord, and I've been saved since 1977, way before a lot of you were born. <sighs> yeah, amen. Um, is that God's faithful. He's so faithful. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. You might take him places where Jesus is kicking and screaming and says, I don't want to go with you, but he'll go anyway. And he'll, he'll bug you to death until you repent. I know, I, I know all about that. Amen. So this song is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Beyond your sky, 
Now I go deep inside. You're alive, yeah. Even when failure seeks to define me, you are there by my side, shining bright, holding tight. fun. I feel warmed up now, so it'll be good. <laughs> Sorry, we'll just get the pulpit sorted and then we'll get into the sermon this morning. Thanks, guys. Thank you. It really is a privilege to be able to preach for you guys this morning. I was <coughs> surprised when your pastor called me up and asked me to come. Um, but yeah, really, really is a privilege to come and be uh, be able to minister to you this morning in this church. You're well known all around the UK fellowship. God's using you powerfully. And uh, yeah, it's just an honor to preach the gospel anywhere though, isn't it? To be saved, to be right with God in our right minds is just an incredible blessing. Amen. But why don't we turn in our Bibles this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 11 to 13. 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. There was a story I read in the news last year about a dog. His name was Copper. This dog, dog was a gold, golden retriever. And the owner of this dog had had it for years. It's a long-term dog, family pet, uh, well-loved by the family. But uh, the owner had come across health complications and stuff and could no longer take care of the dog very well. And so they had to give it up to kennels to then be rehomed into a into another home. So, so they did it anyway. They gave it into the kennels. The kennels found a home for it a few days later. But as the dog, Copper, got to its new house, it escaped. A, dog, a, a door was opened. The dog legged it. They couldn't find it anywhere. 
They put up posters searching for this dog, spent weeks searching for this dog. 27 days after, he, after the dog disappeared, the dog was found 40 miles away back at its previous owner's house. <laughs> That's lovely, isn't it? Right? We love dogs for that because they're faithful, right? They stick to their owners. Uh, but I want to preach this morning about a faithfulness that not even a dog can compare to. I want to preach about God being forever faithful from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. The Bible says, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Forever faithful. Let's pray, church. Father, we come this morning by the blood of Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've saved us and that you're faithful to us. I'm asking this morning, Lord, that you'll encourage people who are going through seasons of life, difficulties, uh, struggles. Uh, God, I pray, give them a revelation of who you are. Lord God, set at liberty those who are oppressed. Uh, convict those uh, who are comfortable. God, speak to us this morning and be glorified. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to talk firstly this morning about our unfaithfulness. We look around the world, and it doesn't take you long to look, but we see that our world is marked by faithlessness. There's many uh, areas of our culture where you can see this. A prime example is uh, how the world approaches marriage nowadays. You know, people have the kids, the car, the mortgage uh, before they even get the ring. People have got it totally the wrong way around because they don't want to commit and be faithful before getting all the other blessings of marriage that come with it. Even in the workplace, it used to be that people would leave school and the first job they got, they would work there for the rest of their life. Right? That would be their job, their profession. That's what they would do. They'd be faithful to that company. Nowadays, people are like two years in and they get a better offer somewhere else or even a year in. I've known people to survive a, th a few months and then they're off somewhere else uh, working in a different job. Even in people's minds, in their thinking, people are bound by faithlessness. People are bound by skepticism. People's thinking is bent towards unbelief. Uh, we're in a faithless generation. And there's many aspects of faithlessness that we could look at in our culture, but the real issue for us this morning is that the world can get upon us as Christians. Because the culture we live in is not a passive culture. Culture, It's actively seeking to change the way that you and I think and you and I act and live our lives. This is why Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world because it's very easy to follow the world's attitudes. It's very easy to accept what they accept. But the problem is, if we allow their unfaithfulness to affect us, then the kingdom of God is affected. And the kingdom of God's all about faith and faithfulness. But our text this morning is not speaking to the world. It's not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to Timothy. Timothy's a pastor of a church. And Paul's addressing uh, this area of lacking faith, because though we are people of faith, often this is an area we struggle with. You know, there's areas we can be faithless in. We can be faithless in our commitment to God. Verse 11 of our text in the CEB translation says, if we are disloyal. You know, it's easy to profess Jesus at church, isn't it? Around your friends, uh, you can talk about Jesus, but what about in the workplace? What about around your friends at school or at university, around your family who aren't saved? Many uh, just melt into the background uh, when times get tough uh, to stand up as a Christian. It's the fear, right, uh, that causes us to, us to be silent. We deny Jesus uh, when the pressure comes. Matthew 26, uh, at the Last Supper, Jesus tells Peter that he's going to deny Jesus. Peter's offended at this idea, right? He says in Matthew 26, 35, even if I have to deny you, uh, sorry, die with you, I will not deny you. He's got this overly confident sense, uh, you know, of, of, of his own strength. Uh, but when the pressure came later that night uh, and people were questioning Peter, he denied Jesus three times. 
And we can struggle in this area as well, church. This is a common place to fall because when the pressure comes, when Satan is all over you and temptation, it tests your faithfulness. We can also lack faith in our devotions. You know, we know that the Bible is the word of God. It's the bread of life. We know that our prayer life is our lifeline to Jesus. That's where we live and die. But yet so many miss these two vital components to their Christian walk. There was a survey done in 2020. They surveyed 2,000 Christians and 38% of these Christians, uh, well, sorry, only 38% of these Christians said that they prayed regularly. They also did a survey in Scotland, uh, and I don't know what's up with the Scots, but they said only 15% of the, of the Christians in Scotland prayed regularly. Maybe it's too cold to get out of bed in the morning, I don't know. But <laughs> part of our fallen nature as humans is that our relationship with God takes work. It's difficult to to dig into the word of God. It's not natural to us. It's easy to be distracted. And therefore, many Christians are very inconsistent and faithless in their devotions. Matthew 26, again, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to go to the cross and he's asking his disciples, pray with me. Come on, I need your help. But where does he find them? Fast asleep. Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yeah. And that's the problem, church, is that yes, we're willing, but our flesh is so faithless. We can also be faithless in our believing of God. You know, how big is God to you? Have you ever said God can't change an area of your life? When you come across uh, difficult circumstances, things that seem impossible, How's your faith? You know, we know the scripture. All things are possible to him who believes. We've heard testimonies of people getting powerfully saved, delivered from all sorts of addictions and issues. We've heard people getting financially blessed, people having miracles of healing. Yet, uh, we can still be faithless. Now, Thomas was a man like us. He walked with Jesus he heard Jesus, he saw the miracles, saw even the dead get raised. And after Jesus was risen and the other disciples had seen him, Thomas wouldn't believe. John 20, 25, he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of his nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. You think he'd seen the miracles. He'd even heard the promise of Jesus saying, I'm going to rise again after I die. But he still, like us, come on, we're not perfect here. He still struggled with faith. And the danger for us, church, with all these struggles, uh, is that because we think this is how I am, and I struggle with faith, and I have all these issues, uh, that we can think that God is the same towards us. But I have good news this morning, and it's that God is nothing like us. And so let's look secondly this morning about God's faithfulness. Because our text is written to Timothy as an encouragement, right? He's not saying, Timothy, you're faithless, just sort it out, mate. Just uh, try harder, work harder, be on time, make sure you get up every day, pray, read your Bible. No, he writes it to him as an encouragement because Timothy himself had his struggles. He was a young man taking over a church. Probably would have been seen as inexperienced, not really knowing what he was doing. He says in 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So we know as a young man, this is what he was going through, struggling with different things. And we know for sure he was a timid guy. He gets the nickname Timid Timothy. Paul writes to him in 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And just like Timothy in our text, uh, we all have our struggles. It could be like Timothy, you struggle with fear. You struggle, you're a young person, you feel inexperienced. Or it could be very different. Everyone has their own weaknesses. We're tempted in different ways. And naturally, the more we struggle with something, the more we can think that God is just not happy with me. That he's uh, somehow just disapproving of all of my mistakes and all of my errors. That some, somehow if I just make one more mistake, God's just going to write me out of the will. 
God's just going to say, right, enough is enough, buddy. You've had it. You're out of here. But in our text, after laying the foundation of our issues and our struggles, Paul zeroes in on our hope, which is God's character. It says in verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He says, yeah, you might struggle. You might have issues, uh, but he's faithful. He doesn't give up. That's who God is. And this is the great hope for us this morning, church, that though we struggle, God doesn't. And he doesn't give up. He doesn't stop believing. He doesn't leave you. He's an ever-present help, and he cannot stop being faithful. Nothing you can do can ever increase his faithfulness towards you or even decrease it towards you because it's who he is. It's his nature. Very quickly, there's five things that you can take to the bank this morning when it comes to trusting God's faithfulness for your life. Firstly, God is faithful to finish. Last year, I was... uh, building a wardrobe in our house in Middlesbrough for our girls in their bedroom, just like a little hanging rail, you know, a few, few drawers and stuff like that, to, and a little reading corner as well, so they could, a storage, and they could sit on top of it. So I built this thing anyway, and then I never painted it. So it was just there, it was wood, it didn't look bad, but I never finished it until like months afterwards. Finally, Holly got the paint out, started painting it, and I was like, all right, okay, I'll do it, all right, I'll finish it off. But how often we do this in life, right? We leave so many jobs unfinished. We leave them part done. We get bored because, you know, we just get distracted by something else in life. But God is not like this. If God God starts a job, he always finishes it. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God began a work in you the day you got saved, and he has not forgotten it. He is is faithful to complete it. It's not stalled. God hasn't missed parts out. You may be frustrated today. You may be looking at yourself like, why God? You're struggling with things. But you can trust that God is faithful to complete you in Christ. Secondly, he's faithful to his promises and this is a bit of a confessional service for me, but uh, when Holly gave birth to the twins, our two girls, uh, I promised her a massage. That was almost six years ago, and she still hasn't had it. <laughs> she still reminds me of it today. <laughs> Thank God he's not like me, right? <laughs> if God says something to you, he's going to do it. It can't be changed. God cannot lie. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, All the promises of God are in Him, yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Yeah, you may not feel like you're worthy. Yeah, you may feel like, oh, I messed up again, or I didn't pray this morning. But His promises are His promises. It's not based on your performance. He always keeps His word. Jeremiah 1.12 in the Amplified says, I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. So he's not watching, watching over you to see if you're good enough. He's watching over his word. And then he will perform it. And you may have had promises in this place years ago. Words God spoke over your life. Maybe they haven't come to, come to pass yet. You think, hey God, what's going on? He hasn't forgotten. He's faithful. In the Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah. She was barren. They had a promise from God of a, of a child. He was like 75 years old. They wait over two decades. But God was faithful. Genesis 21.1 in the New Living Version says, Then the Lord visited Sarah as he had said and did for her as he had promised. So it doesn't matter the time between the promise and it coming to pass. God's faithful to his promises. And he doesn't forget them. Third thing he's faithful in is it is faithful to you. You know, God counts you. If you're born again, if you're saved in this place, God counts you as his child. You're his son or his daughter. You're in his family, and God doesn't leave his family members. And you see his faithfulness towards his people 
in the nation of Israel. You know, we know the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and Exodus, you know, it takes them ages to get to the promised land because of all their disobedience, uh, worshipping false gods. Uh, Even in the promised land, they repeatedly went after false gods. But God time and again disciplined his children and then brought them back because he's faithful. And even now, you look at the nation of Israel, it's a miracle. Right, This little tiny nation surrounded by people that hate it, and yet it flourishes and blossoms. No one can destroy it. It's blessed because, not because they're a perfect nation, because they're not, but because God's faithful. And you and I can hold on to that, church. God's not looking for you to be perfect. He's not looking for you to have every, you know, all of your ducks in a row, as we say, or all of the T's crossed and the I's dotted. Yeah, that's right. Isn't that the right way of saying it? God's faithful. God won't let go of you through the seasons of life. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you were called in, pulled into his family. Because of his faithfulness, and he's not going to let go of you. And the fourth thing, he's faithful in, and he's, 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 he's even faithful to the unfaithful. You know, our limit as humans of commitment and faithfulness is usually reached when we lose interest in something, or we don't see any value or any return coming back from that thing, or when someone's unfaithful to us, we'll, we'll break it off, or if they hurt us in some way, you know, see you later, no longer a part of my life. But even in this, God isn't like us. Jeremiah 3.14 says, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. It's amazing. God keeps his covenant even if you break it. And don't test it. You know, don't take that as license to go and sin. Because you will go to hell. But God doesn't break his covenant with you. This shows us who he is. It's his nature. You know, the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus says, I'm the shepherd. I'm going after my sheep. The prodigal son went off unfaithful. It was the father who waited. It was his son. And he's faithful to the unfaithful. And then fifthly, God is always faithful to forgive. Now, the disciples in the Gospels, they come to Jesus and they ask him, how many times do I need to forgive this jerk over here, right? (laughs) This guy is doing my nut in. Seven times, then can I kill him, please? (laughs) Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And they're like, what? I'm going to lose count. How am I meant to do that? (laughs) And you may think, God, how can you forgive me again? How can I've messed up again? It's like I'm banging my head against the wall. How can you forgive me again? Forgiveness is never to do with us. Forgiveness is not an issue of you being perfect or even deserving it. Forgiveness is a, is a result of God's faithfulness. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because he sees the blood of the Lamb If you see some God, I've messed up again. Please forgive me. Boom. Done. He's faithful. That's it. If you confess to God when you've messed up, it's gone. It's washed away. It's forgiven. Because it's who he is. So let's consider in closing, thirdly this morning, trusting in his faithfulness. Because though we can read about God's character, and though we can agree with this and be amazed by God's nature and who he is, We need to be changed by his faithfulness. Now, the nature of man is that generally we want to have everything under control in life. You know, we get uncomfortable when things go wrong or when things don't go as we expect or plan for them to go. You know, many get so obsessed by controlling everything in their life, don't they? If one little thing goes out of of whack, it's it's over, right? They can't handle it. Your, Your pastor... He told me a story ages ago that when he was younger, I think he was a teenager, his mum and dad took them to the Rocky Mountains uh, for a holiday. And one of, the, one of the events they did is they, 
went on a horse ranch and they were going to go horse riding for a day. Now, none of them had ever ridden a horse before, so they obviously had, you know, horses that are easy to ride for beginners and stuff. So they just followed a horse in front of them and it's just a nice experience. But anyway, they had to fill out forms before they went in. You know, when you do experiences, you have to put your name, sign a waiver, that kind of stuff. Uh, but on these forms, they had to put their experience level. Now, who's met Lisa, your pastor's mum before? She's a sweet little lady, isn't she? That's what you think. <laughs> she was filling out their forms. <laughs> and she wrote on Mark, uh, Pastor Claxton's dad's form, on the experience level, she wrote experienced. <laughs> He's never ridden a horse in his life. <laughs> so anyway, they give him this big, massive horse. He's like, oh, what's going on here? He gets on the horse. They're riding off along the trail. And all of a sudden, this horse starts bucking and kicking and, and all of a sudden bolts it along this trail. And his dad is freaking out. Hasn't got a clue what to do. They're all cracking up, having a great time. <laughs> but this can be like life, right? We try and control it. To, but the truth is you can't control everything. And life is going to kick you one day. Life's going to buck you. It's going to give you some uncomfortable experiences. Uh, all of a sudden, life's going to bolt. When you think you've got it all under control. Maybe that things are working out sometimes. Then all of a sudden you go through a season and things have all turned upside down. And the question that always presents us is can I trust in God's faithfulness when all, of the, all around me is going to pot? And our text church gives us the answer this morning. That the only constant in this changing world is God. Verse 13 says, he cannot deny himself. This is an incredible truth that you and I must hold on to because it's saying that even if God wanted to be unfaithful, he can't. <laughs> even if he, he wanted to change his heart towards you, he can't. It's who he is. He can't deny his own nature. He's faithful always, now and forever. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. He does not change. And it's very key here that this is not a license for you and I to sin. That just because God will always forgive us, he'll always be with us, he'll never give up on us. That's not an excuse to live an unfaithful life. Actually, when you encounter God's faithfulness, it should make you want to be more faithful. Right? You think of Peter. When Jesus restored Peter by the sea, after Peter had this incredible failure of unfaithfulness, denying Jesus, Jesus restores him. And no doubt, Peter would have been incredibly touched by Jesus' faithfulness to him. Because Jesus didn't write him off. He said, right, Peter, you're bottom of the list now. James, you're up. Come on, you're the leader. He didn't say, nah, Peter, maybe another time. He said, Peter, you've still got purpose. Peter, I'm still going to use you. You're still mine. I'm not done with you. And we know Peter's life following that. This led Peter to live for Jesus in an incredibly faithful way. And so knowing God's faithfulness should actually make you more faithful. Don't take it in the wrong way. But the hope for us this morning is that when we go through these seasons of life where the horse is kicking us off and we can't control things and we have no idea what's going on because trust me, it's coming. If you haven't got there yet, it's coming. The hope is we can trust God through any season of life because he's faithful. But you have to trust him. If you don't trust him, then you remain disconnected from all the blessings that flow from trusting in his faithfulness. Because when you're going through it and you trust in him, God adds something to your life. Psalm 37, 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So it makes me think, you know, we get up in the morning and we feed our stomachs, you know. Also, we should get up in the morning and just fill ourselves with his faithfulness, right? Stuff our face with his faithfulness. Just get filled up with it. Feed ourselves with who he is. Because this revelation of his character will change your life. When you know who he is, and you're going through a season of life that's just horrible, you can get through. It will set you free from worry and anxiety. You can get through seasons with hope 
and security in God. But most importantly, it gives you a confidence in God, in who he is, and you can rely on his word. No wonder Paul says in our text in verse 11, this is a faithful saying. In other words, this isn't going to fail. You can trust God because he's faithful this morning, church. Amen. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. We're going to pray very shortly. But before we do, this morning, if you're not saved, you're not right with God, you don't know God. This may be your first time coming into church. You don't really understand everything that's happening, but if you just hear one thing this morning, I want to just share the gospel with you. Jesus Christ came to this earth so that you and I might live. And you may think, hey, I'm alive. My heart's beating, right? I've got blood thrown, flowing through my veins. So the truth is, you may be alive physically, but spiritually, if you're separated from God, you're dead. Our sin kills our spirit. We're not alive to God when we're living in our sin. We can't know Him. We're separated from Him. That's why you're so unfulfilled. That's why there's issues in your life that you can't control because spiritually you're dead. You're separated from your Creator. Jesus Christ came to this earth to give you life, to make you born again. He died on the cross as a payment for your sin. To set you free because he loves you so much. He doesn't want to, you to burn in a devil's hell. He wants you to be saved, to be right with him. To be drawn into his family. This morning, if you're not saved, you don't know Jesus. But you want to get right with him. Just lift your hand up in the air. No one's looking around. It's between you and God. I see that hand. Any others? I see that hand. Bless you. There's others here this morning. You don't know Jesus. And you're struggling. Is, is he really telling the truth? Can I really trust Jesus to forgive me of my sin? Yes, you can. But you have to trust him. You have to have faith in him. You have to take that step of faith and trust in Jesus that he'll forgive you. Raise your hand. There's others in this place this morning. You want to get right with him. You want to leave your sin behind. Jesus can give you a brand new start this morning. I see that hand. God bless you. Amen. You can put those hands down. There's backsliders in this place. You knew Jesus one time, but you've been faithless. You've left. You've left the faith. You're back in sin. Jesus was drawing you home. Jesus is drawing you back because despite your failures and mistakes, which we have all done in this place, Jesus himself is faithful. And he wants you to come back right now. Raise your hand. You're backslidden. Not right with God. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Last call. Join these others. Raise your hand. You're not saved or backslidden. We'll pray with you this morning. Amen. Those who raise their hands. Would you just look at me? Did you mean that, sister? Amen. Would you just come? Someone's going to come pray with you. There's others. You, you raise your hand. These children that raise their hands, would you come? If you raise your hand, just come out to the front. God's going to come. We need a sister to come and pray with a lady down the front here. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Okay, God bless you. Church, God's faithfulness is such a hope, it's such a blessing for us that we don't deserve. Nothing that God does for, does for us do we deserve. But he does it for us because he loves us. And it's because it's who he is. And yes, this morning you may be going through a season that's uncomfortable. A season that's a, a struggle. Things you don't understand. Things are going on like, how does this fit in line with, with what you said, God? What's going on? The hope you can hang on to is God is faithful. God's going to bring you through. His promises are His promises. You're His child. God will always take care of you. And that revelation of His faithfulness should obviously change our lives. Make us more faithful people. If God's spoken to you this morning. These altars are open, church. Why don't we come? Let's make a place to pray. 
Let's uh, ask God to fill us with a sense of his uh, love, his faithfulness. Let's be thankful for who he is. Let's cast our cares upon him. He cares for us. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. nothing on earth I desire besides you. the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart and my portions for Let's give him praise, church. Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Yeah, would you like to come up? <laughs> You've been through some stuff, right? sees and it's not it's not all pointless you know sometimes we think that like what's the point of this nothing's happening but God's with you okay he's doing the work yeah you may have made mistakes things may have not gone to plan but it's in those times right <laughs> when you can just see him and you got to let him in right 
feed on his faithfulness. That's what it says. Because when we do that, it's going to be amazing what he's going to do in your heart. And I really feel God is just, sorry, he's all over you. pray for healing right now in his heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you treat us and you deal with us, Lord, in ways we do not deserve. And God, I cast out shame from his life. I cast out every lie of hell. Thank you, Jesus, that you have a plan for him, Lord, that you're with him. Lord, that no weapon formed against him shall prosper. God, fill him with your spirit. Touch him right now, Lord. Give him a sense of your divine love, your divine glory over his life, Lord. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we sing that song again? Let's raise our hands, church. Thank you, Father God, that you here are here, Lord. God, heal hearts in this place. Give vision for the future, oh God. Lord, open people's eyes. Lord, rob your sandbag. We worship you, oh Lord God. You are our Father. Thank you, Father God, that you are for us, Lord. Who can be against us? When I'm out of rubbish, yet will be saved. Hallelujah. God is so good to us. Because it's who He is. Right? It's who He is. Don't take your eyes off of Him. You know? Feed on His faithfulness. You know, it's been a real blessing uh, for me and my dad to come here this morning. And, be with you guys this morning, church. So thank you very much for opening your hearts and and coming out this morning. Come out tonight, uh, 5.30 for prayer, I think it is. 6.30, your evening service begins. Uh, uh, Why don't we give God praises? I think Philippe, come and take the service. Uh, Amen. Father, we thank you. Amen, church. No doubt, go out knowing that we serve a faithful God. He sees you. He's El Roy. He sees. He's, we serve the God who sees. Amen. Um, we're going to close in a word of prayer. Go and have a good afternoon this, um, this afternoon. Go and God be blessed. Go eat. Go fellowship. Whatever you're doing, may God's uh, hand be upon your life. And I'm going to ask my brother Mark to, to close us in a word of prayer. Amen.
man, walk in victory.